Once upon a time, in the remote village of BEM, there was an old man named Dango Makongo, known to everyone for his harsh character and brusque manners. Azingo Makongo was not an ordinary old man. He dragged behind him a heavy past. In his youth, Azingo had left the village to try his luck in the city, his heart swollen with dreams of wealth and success. He had imagined that the city would offer him a life of grandeur and opulence, but the reality of the city was very different from what he had imagined. The work there was difficult, and money was scarce. Impatient and refusing to work hard to build his future, Azingo Makongo had decided to take a shortcut. Rather than persevere and get his hands dirty, he had engaged in questionable activities, descending into theft to survive. On two occasions, he had been caught red-handed and sentenced to prison. Despite this, he had not changed. Instead of repenting, Azingo had emerged more embittered. He started stealing again each time. But one day, his misdeeds had almost cost him his life. After a botched theft, he had narrowly escaped popular vindictiveness. Furious passers-by had rushed towards him, ready to make him pay for his crimes. Trembling with fear, Azingo had run like crazy to escape them. That time, he understood that he could no longer stay in town without risking his life. Disappointed and overwhelmed by fear, he made the decision to return to the village. Old Azingo Makongo had thus spent his entire life in the village, sinking little by little into the solitude of those old days. He had neither wife nor child. At 70 years old, he watched with a mixture of nostalgia and melancholy as the young people left, one by one, towards the city, just as he had done in the past. Their departures reminded him of his own youth, full of hope and dreams. He saw in these young people the same fire that had once animated him, and this awakened in him memories, sometimes sweet, sometimes bitter. Despite his troubled past, the young people of the village had a sincere, almost blind respect for Azingo. He embodied the image of the patriarch, the wise old survivor of a distant era. Their parents sometimes whispered stories about him, but he never revealed the dark details of his youth. To these young people, full of benevolence, he was a figure of admiration, especially during festivals and traditional gatherings. He returned temporarily to the village. The young people did not fail to take a detour through the old house of Azingo. They arrived with their arms full, with smiles on their lips and presents that testified to their respect and their desire to pay homage to the old sage they believed they saw in him. Old Azingo, here is a small bottle of this whiskey that you like, one exclaimed, laughing as he handed him the carefully wrapped bottle. Ah, old Azingo, some new clothes for you, added others, giving him a clean shirt and pants. Azingo received his gifts with a sort of shy pride. He murmured, touched, thanks, but without showing it. One day, as he observed the comings and goings of the young people returning to the village for the festivals, Azingo Makongo felt a mixture of jealousy and bitterness rising within him. Sitting on an old wooden chair in front of his house, he looked at the young men and women with their modern clothes and their shiny cars. They laughed, talking about their success and life in the city, without suspecting that their words brought back old memories and also deep resentment. But what do these young people believe? He whispered through gritted teeth, his gaze darkening. They come here, showing off their cars as if they wanted to humiliate me, to remind me that I did not succeed there. The anger boiled in his heart. Azingo could not accept that his young people, these children of the village, could have what he had sought so much in vain. He told himself that if he had not succeeded in the city, then no one from here should succeed there either. If I, Azingo Makongo, went to town and was not successful, it is certainly not one of these young people who will succeed, he said to himself, tightening his fists. His wounded pride, his failure never digested. All of this formed a bitter mixture that pushed him to want to see them fail, as if to justify his own errors. 
Consumed by his resentment and his desire for revenge, Azingo Makongo made a decision that would mark a turning point in his life. Without speaking to anyone, he set off for a distant village, a place said to house ancient mysteries and secrets. This village, nestled in the heart of the forest, was not a place one visited without reason. The rare people who ventured there often had dark motivations and hidden intentions. It took him days of walking through winding paths and thick forests to finally reach this mysterious place. There lived Ieboto, an old sorcerer feared by all. It was said that he had powers capable of transforming the darkest desires into reality. When Azingo arrived in front of his hut, he found him sitting calmly but with a keen eye, as if he was already expecting him. The old wizard Ieboto scrutinized him in silence, guessing without difficulty the heaviness of his heart and the darkness of his intentions. What do you want, old man? asked Ieboto, his hoarse voice resounding like a threatening whisper. Azingo stood up as best he could, his back bent and his hands trembling, betraying his advanced age. I want you to give me the power to harm these young people who taunt me, he declared in a cold voice. Give me something, a cane, so that I can cast curses without them suspecting anything. Let this cane seem to be my support, but in reality, it carries the power of destruction. The sorcerer Ieboto, though master of many obscure powers, hesitated to grant Azingo what he asked. He observed the old man, reading in his eyes the blinding resentment that had brought him this far. These young people have done nothing wrong to you. Why do you want to cause them harm? asked the sorcerer, a serious look on his face. Azingo tightened his fists, his eyes shining with anger and desire. No, Ieboto, they taunt me. I went to town, I didn't succeed, and they succeed. They come back to the village strutting around with their new clothes, their cars, as if it were easy. It can't continue like this. Ieboto sighed, shaking his head slowly. Azingo, he said in a voice full of wisdom, be careful. He who spits in the air receives it on his nose. Revenge has a price, and he who seeks to harm often reaps a greater evil than the one he wanted to inflict. But Azingo, in his blindness, refused to pay attention to his words of caution. He then took out a large sum of money and placed it in front of Ieboto. Here, for you, Ieboto, give me this cane and let the curse fall on them. The sorcerer, aware of the consequences, took the money in silence. Without another word, he set to work, carving a cane from wood with an ancient pattern filled with secret and powerful symbols. The cane had the appearance of a simple walking stick, but it contained a dark energy ready to fulfill Azingo's dark desires. When the sorcerer handed him the cane, he gave him a final warning, his voice deep and full of threat. Listen to me carefully, Azingo. What you are preparing to do is irreversible. This cane is not a toy. It carries within it the revenge that you desire, but it also demands a price. Evil is only paid for with evil. Keep that in mind. But Azingo, carried by his thirst for revenge, did not want to hear anything. He grabbed the cane from the sorcerer's hands without paying attention to this final warning. He left the sorcerer's village and took the road toward his own village, his heart beating with anticipation. With this cane, he finally felt in a position of power. He was now ready to see his revenge accomplished, without worrying about the consequences. Upon returning to the village with his cane, Azingo Makongo went unnoticed by everyone. He was only an old man with a slow gait, leaning on his stick, his back bent by the years. His cane, although loaded with a curse, simply looked like the tool of a tired old man. The festivities were in full swing, and the young people of the village were returning to celebrate as they did every year on this day. As he walked slowly along the road, Azingo was greeted by one of the young men of the village who had just parked his car on the downhill side. The young man approached him with a respectful smile. Hold, Father Azingo, 
a small ticket for you to enjoy these days of celebration, he said, handing him a sum of money with eyes full of respect. Azingo took the money with a sly smile, holding his cane firmly in the other hand. He hid it twice discreetly on the ground while internally muttering his curse. Oh, thank you, my boy. May God bless you, he said in a soft voice, masking his resentment behind kind words. Then he continued on his way. Further along, he came across a young woman who had become a source of pride for the village. In town, she had managed to open a renowned hair salon, and each time she returned, she showed generosity toward the elders. When she saw him, she approached with a broad smile and placed a bag of rice at his feet. Oh, Father Azingo, here is a bag of rice for you, she said, proud to be able to help the elders of the village. Azingo took the bag, giving her a slight smile, but his mind was filled with resentment. As Ada turned away, he discreetly hit his cane on the ground once again, silently murmuring a curse against her, against her success, against her happiness. Throughout his journey, Azingo received numerous presents, and each time, he repeated his ritual. With each note, each bag of rice, each benevolent smile, he secretly launched a curse. No one suspected that this old man, though so withdrawn into himself, harbored such poison in his heart. For everyone, he was just a respected elder, a man to whom they owed honor and help. As the holidays ended, a strange malaise fell upon the young people of Bilham. Those who, in previous years, returned to town with enthusiasm felt this time an inexplicable weight in their hearts. Although they had stores, companies, and promising positions in town, the desire to resume their urban life seemed to have died out. For some, this feeling was so oppressive that they chose to delay their departure, finding excuses to stay a little longer in the village. Those who managed to convince themselves to return to town discovered, once there, that something had changed. The town, once a symbol of their success and ambition, suddenly seemed hostile and meaningless to them. Little by little, strange events began to occur. Businesses that had been thriving until then began to decline for no apparent reason. Customers became scarce, opportunities seemed to fade away, and obstacles piled up in unexpected ways. Ada, the once proud young woman with her thriving hair salon, was among the first to pay the price. Her salon, which once attracted a loyal clientele, gradually lost its luster. Clients began to desert without explanation, and despite all her efforts, she was no longer able to get back on track. In a few months, she had to resign herself to closing the shop and returning to the village, her dream broken, her heart heavy with regret. The other young people from Bilham did not take long to follow the same path. One by one, they returned to the village, dejected, drained of their ambitions and energy, as if an invisible force had torn away their dreams. Bilham, once proud of these young people who returned with tales of success, now saw them return with heads bowed, left with no choice but to accept the poverty of their homeland. Concerned by this strange and disconcerting situation, the elders gathered one evening around the large fire in the village square. Each had a son or daughter who once seemed destined for a good future in the city, yet now all their children were back. One elder spoke, haven't you noticed, brothers, that all our children who seem to succeed in town are now with us, doing nothing, as if something pulled them from their dreams and brought them back here with no choice. A murmur of agreement ran through the group. Another elder with slumped shoulders added sadly, my son, who had opened a successful garage in town, lost everything. He went bankrupt without any reason, everything collapsed in the blink of an eye. An elderly woman, her face deeply lined with age, added, my daughter, so proud of her hair salon, also went bankrupt. Nothing worked as before, and she had to return to the village, heartbroken. A third elder spoke, shaking his head. My son owned a supermarket, and overnight, 
everything burned down, a complete loss. He has nothing left and is back among us, reduced to idleness. Silence fell over the group as each absorbed their thoughts. One fateful day, Ada, once the owner of a successful hair salon in town, sat on the veranda of her small village house, lost in thought. She sighed, her cheek resting in her hand, reflecting on this new life she was reluctantly leading. Here I am, resigned to living in the village, she murmured bitterly. I had a salon that was doing well, but here, at least, I can enjoy fresh air. Determined to make the best of her situation, she rose, took her basket, and headed toward the fields to gather firewood. The clear sky gave no hint of what was to come. She walked quietly among the trees, picking up dry branches. While searching the ground, she suddenly came across a strange piece of wood lying among the dead leaves. She leaned over to examine it. The wood seemed dry, perfect for fire, but what caught her attention were the strange engravings on it. Intrigued, she took it in her hand, turning it from all angles. What is this wood with strange engravings? She murmured. It's very dry. It should burn perfectly. Without further thought, she added it to her bundle and continued gathering. But as she worked, the sky suddenly darkened, and a violent wind began to blow, stirring dust and making leaves dance. She hurriedly adjusted her shawl, tied her bundle of wood, and started running back to the village to avoid the rain. As she ran to escape the first drops, she noticed old Zingo Mekongwo also moving quickly. However, something strange caught her eye. A Zingo, usually stooped, stood straight and walked without difficulty. His usual cane was absent. Yet, as the rain began to pour, she had no time to think further. Back at home, Ada began preparing her evening meal. She gathered the dry branches and lit the fire. When the time was right, she added the strange which she had found in the forest, thinking it would burn perfectly. But as soon as it began to burn, a brilliant light burst from the fire, illuminating her entire room with a supernatural glow. Suddenly, a piercing scream broke the villagers quiet. Startled, Ada turned toward the sound, which seemed to come from Azingo Mekongwo's house. Villagers, drawn by the strange scream, rushed over to see what was happening. They found Azingo in a state of utter panic, writhing on the floor of his house, his face contorted with pain, his eyes rolling back as he cried, I'm burning, I'm burning. One of the elders approached him with a worried look. Azingo, what's happening? Why are you shouting like that? Gripped by unbearable pain, Azingo gasped, his body shaking with convulsions. He searched around him with outstretched hands as if trying to grab an invisible object. My cane! Where is my cane? I need my cane! He cried, his voice breaking, his distress evident. Sensing his end was near, Azingo confessed everything. He revealed the horrifying truth. It was me. I cursed the young people. This cane carried the curse. I wanted them to fail, to not succeed where I failed. The villagers, stunned, listened in silence, realizing the depth of jealousy and darkness in Azingo's heart. Helplessly, they watched as he writhed in burning agony until his body seemed to consume itself, slowly fading like embers dying in invisible flames. Meanwhile, in Ada's house, the fire continued to burn with an intense glow, illuminating her surroundings with supernatural brightness. As if awakening from a heavy sleep, she shook her head, a new clarity coming over her. Memories of her hair salon in town and her lost ambitions resurfaced. She wondered why she was still in the village. One by one, the other young people also found their minds clearing, as though emerging from a fog. The light emanating from Ada's fire seemed to free their stolen destinies, restoring their dreams, hopes, and will to succeed. They realized that this strange glow had broken the chain binding them to the village. 
The villagers standing outside Azingo's house understood that his envy and resentment had cursed an entire generation, but now the darkness he sowed had vanished with him, leaving the village in peace. Freed from the curse, the young people bid farewell to the village, ready to resume their paths in the city, their futures open before them once again. With determination, Ada prepared to return and rebuild her salon. The lesson of this story is the danger of jealousy and resentment. Azingo Makongwo, consumed by the bitterness of his own failures, chose to hate those who succeeded where he did not. His jealousy led him to commit dark acts that ultimately deepened his own loneliness and sealed his tragic fate. This story teaches us that harboring negative feelings toward others ultimately turns against oneself. Jealousy and resentment are poisons that first destroy those who carry them. Azingo could have chosen to support the young people, to guide them. Instead, by wishing for their failure, he hastened his own downfall. On the other hand, despite their hardships, the young people found their way and regained their ambitions, showing that success is built on determination and perseverance, not on tearing others down. The message is clear, the success and happiness of others do not diminish our own. On the contrary, supporting them enriches the entire community.